Hello students, welcome to this lesson. I am Gopinath Dotto, Assistant Professor, Kumbudri Government College. Today, I am going to hold a class of Honours 3rd year English Discipline of National University on Alfred Lord Tennyson. One of the most major poets of the Victorian period, and I hope you will. You are all getting on well. You are fine. We have entered into a new normal life. Corona pandemic, which is a global dilemma, has changed our life, living, and lifestyle. And we have to conform to this new life. We have to wear the masks wash out our hands and mouths frequently and we have to brought about some changes in our living and everyday activities we have to follow some health rules we have to maintain the hygiene and we have to maintain the social distancing and I hope you are doing this anyway before I start my class, I would like to refer to the learning aspects of today. Today's learning aspect is the poem Locksley Hall, one of the most major poems of Alfred Lord Tennyson. I will explain the poem critically, interpret it, and then accordingly, I will focus on the contextual university questions which are common in the national universities and I hope you will follow this class you are ready with your text with the poem as you know Alfred Lord Tennyson a very prominent name in English literature and in world literature he was born in 1809 and died in 1892 his major works are Poems by Two Brothers, which was published in 1827. And uh, this poem, this collection of poems, this poetical book was published at his young age. His, along with his two brothers, his two brothers are also poet. And then in 1847, he published The Princess. Then his most famous poetical book in memoriam was published in 1850 what is important to add here is that his in memoriam is a collection of poetry there are a good number of poetry a series of poetry which have been dedicated to his most intimate friend arthur hallam arthur hallam has a deep mark on the life and poetry of Alfred Tennyson and uh, this poetical book is the spiritual autobiography of Alfred Lord Tennyson. The Idols of the, Idols of the King was published in 1859 then in 1886 Locksley Hall 60 years after etc was published. These are the major publications by Alfred Lord Tennyson and his contemporary writers there are some famous contemporary writers poets and novelists of his time you know and uh, it is also included in your syllabus I have uh, read the poem of Robert Browning Matthew Arnold Hopkins they are his contemporary poets and his contemporary novelists are Thomas Hardy, Charles Dickens, Thackeray, uh, Stevenson and some other writers and uh, they are the contemporaries of Alfred Lord Tennyson. Alfred Lord Tennyson was the national poet of England. He was also a poet laureate, laureate. the poet laureate of England. Before him, William Wordsworth 
uh, a prominent romantic poet was the poet laureate of England and uh, after William Wordsworth he became the poet laureate of England anyway his father was a rector of Mid Lincolnshire Mid Lincolnshire is very famous for its natural beauty it has nice and fantastic uh, uh, landscape upon this background he was born and brought up as to the personality of Alfred Lord Tennyson we can uh, say that he possessed a very attractive personality uh, that's why he was very popular in his writing he reflected his time accurately that's why he became very popular in England and about him Carlyle describes that he was a most restful brotherly and solid-hearted man from Carlyle's comment we can easily have some idea about his personality and about his poetry professor Webb another prominent writer commented that his poetry is uh, famous for its clearness of conception. It has noble simplicity of expression. And for this, his poetry is an integral part of the world. This is how two prominent writers, Carlyle and Professor Webb, commented uh, on the life and uh, works of Tennyson. Tennyson is widely known as a literary historian. In his poetry, he reflected his age accurately and aptly. Interestingly, uh, if you uh, read his poetry, you will uh, easily be able to peep through the age of Victorian period. Uh, when did it uh, occur in English literature? Victorian age began in 1830 and continued till 1900. It covers, it covered the period of uh, almost 70 years. And uh, in English literature, it's a very uh, famous period for its complex tendency. Uh, it was a period of, it was a, it was an era of peace. It was an era of progress and political development it was also at the same time in an era of intellectual development uh, england experienced many new things at the at that period it was a period of peace uh, firstly victorian age was this name was designated uh, 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 after the name of august queen victoria was very powerful at that time. She ascended the throne in uh, 1837. And uh, uh, the period is also known as a period of peace. Why the period is known as a period of peace? It doesn't mean that uh, everything was all right at that time. England has extended its empire around the world. Once it was said that there was there is no sundown in British Empire. Crimean War took place and many colonial war took place. And you know, in uh, 1789, French Revolution also took place, which created a great commotion, a great chaos and confusion. After almost 40 years, this period, Victorian period, appeared and I, I told you that it was a period of peace though French Revolution took place 40 years back from that time the socio-economic condition of England was very peaceful and despite the fact that there were some colonial war and uh, Crimean war also took place at that time despite all these things Peace as a whole 
existed in the British society. And it was also a period of progress. It was a period of progress because many scientific invention uh, was, uh, can be found at that period. Steam engine was invented and railway, construction of railway, there was huge communication and uh, uh, mills and factories and uh, there are many people from villages turned to the town, industrialization and urbanization took place. As a whole, British society experienced a dip different period at the time. And it was also a uh, flourishment of political power. I uh, use this phrase because uh, a, an important bill in British Parliament was passed in 1832. Uh, and, and because of this, uh, uh, which is known in history, in, in, in the history of England, which is known as Reform uh, Act of 1832. With the Reform Act, with the Reformation, people, uh, there was the political power was diversified, it was multiplied, and uh, there was a change, power was not concentrated at that time. With the passing of this bill, democracy also developed, and this, this is the political scenario of the time, and it was also a period of intellectual development. Very important uh, book by a uh, naturalist, famous naturalist, Darwin, uh, was published at that time. The name of the book is Evolution of Species, in which it has been uh, experimentally shown that all uh, species are linked and how we, uh, the human spe species was originated is aptly uh, written there. You can see the image. Uh, I, I have, uh, I'm going to show you some images of the evolution, theory of evolution, and there was a conflict between faith, religious faith of the people and science. Uh, it was an age of ideological conflict. At that time, religion and science conflicted, despite this fact that people also learned to live and coexist together. They compromised, which is known as Victorian compromise. This uh, uh, phrase, perhaps you have heard this phrase, Victorian compromise. What, what is that? Victorian compromise means uh, during the Victorian period, science and technology developed immensely and many things were prophesied by Tennyson also. Uh, at the same time, uh, people learned how to coexist. They accepted the newer inventions and discoveries and they also uh, had serene faith. That means there was a compromise between the two, faith and religious faith and uh, the uh, development of science. So now is the time for analyzing the poem. Uh, as, I, as I have told you that Tennyson is the most representative poem of the time and Loxley Hall uh, is the poem where he has upheld the A's very accurately and meticulously. Actually, there is no existence of a hall in the name of Loxley Hall. In reality, it is the creation of his imagination. Uh, uh, it's a long poem consisting of 190 lines and uh, it was uh, composed in uh, 1835 and published in 
1842. If we want to, uh, actually, I'm not going to read the poem line by line and verse by verse. It's a long poem, as I told you, I have the constraint of time and space. So, I would like to uh, focus on the points which are important, and uh, uh, but you will read it line by line. I will read and analyze only the key points. The poem, the entire poem is spoken by a man who is a soldier. There are some characters, I am uh, telling you, there is a soldier who speaks out the poem and we can also uh, uh, feel the presence of the comrades, his comrades. They are, they are just going to a particular place in a business and uh, we can also see the presence of Amy, very most uh, important character, and Amy's parents. The story is simple. The soldier, in his uh, youth, used to live in the Loxley Hall and he was madly in love with Amy. They both loved each other, but the love was not fructified, it was not reciprocated. The parents of Amy did not accept the affairs. Now, while passing by the Loxley Hall, all on a sudden, the speaker approaches the Loxley, approaches the Loxley Hall and he becomes greatly reminiscent and mindful of those days when he used to live in the Loxley Hall. I'm, uh, just the poem begins abruptly. Uh, I'm reading it out. Comrades, leave me here a little while as yet it's early morn. Leave me here and when you want me, sound upon the bugle horn. It's the place and all around it as of old the Carlius call. Dreary gleams about the moonland flying over the Loxley Hall. Loxley Hall that in the distance overlooks the sandy tracks and the hollow ocean, ocean ridges roaring into cataracts. Many a night from yonder I hit casement ere I went to rest. Did I look on Great Orion sloping slowly to the west? Many a night I saw the Pleiades rising through the mellow shade glitter like a swarm of fireflies tangled in a silvery braid. It's a dramatic monologue and the poem is written in the form of dramatic monologue. Where there is a speaker and you can also feel the presence of other persons. He uh, suddenly, the speaker of the poem, urges his comrades to leave him back because he is beside the Loxley Hall a place of his memory, he is a man of memory. So, he requests his comrades that it is still early morning, uh, we are still in time, we are not in a hurry, please leave me here for a while, and when you need me, you will call me uh, by uh, uh, blowing the bugle horn. You can see the image of bugle horn, it's a kind of horn which is used for calling people. And it's the place and all around it, the speaker says, the soldier, the speaker says, it's the place and all around it, as of old, the Carlius call. In his youthful days, when he used to live in the Loxley Hall, uh, he, uh, his cousin, Amy, uh, uh, also was also living there. And Carlu, Carlu is the name of a bird. Carlu is the name of a bird. Carlu used to call and dreary gleams about the moonland flying over the Loxley Hall. Dreary, this is the picture, this is the setting and background of the poem. Uh, we can, uh, you know, Tennyson was a great master of drawing pictures. He uh, uh, drew pictures by the magic of words. Moonland, in front of the Loxley Hall, 
there is a woodland. Woodland means it's open, wide open grassy land. All right. Uh, and flying over Loxley Hall, this is the site. You know, uh, this is a deeply psychological method that a man is mindful of the past by three things sight, sound, and smell. Sight, sound, and smell are potential enough to remind the past. And this is what actually happens here. Loxley Hall, there in the distance, overlooks the sandy tracts. I, I explain it. Sandy tracts. In front of the Loxley Hall, there is a bullland and it overlooks the sandy tracts. And the hollow ocean ridges roaring into the cataract. There are cataracts, Paul. Many a night from yonder I feel casement, yo, I went rest. Did I look on Great Orion sloping slowly to the west? That is very, uh, uh, you can see minute pictures. And uh, Orion is the name of constellation. Emmy and this young man used to stay inside the Loxley Hall and through the casement they used to see the Orion going down to the going down and they have seen this uh, this is the memory many a night I saw the Pleiades Pleiades is also name of a constellation you know constellation means a group of stars a group of stars uh, consist of a constellation Orion and Pleiades are the names of constellation rising through the below shade glitter like a swarm fireflies tangled in a silver braid they used to see the orion and pleiades through the casement casement means windows through the windows of the loxley hall both of them used to see the pleiades and orions and these are the memories and he is mindful of this memory just approaching the Loxley Hall. The Loxley Hall, where the speaker spent his days of youth, and this is the house of uh, memory. The soldier, the speaker, as I told you earlier, that this is, a, uh, this is an example of dramatic monologue, one of the most famous dramatic monologue in English literature. And you know what dramatic monologue is. Monologue, mono means single, one. Single or one. And lock means discourse or discussion or conversation. Which means it is spoken by a single person. And here we have got the speaker. Uh, actually, uh, it's important to add here that Alfred Tennyson got the idea of this poem from an Arabic uh, poem uh, which was composed by an Arabic bird, in which you can see that uh, one person uh, recollects the days of his youth, recollects, stands by the house, by house, beside the house, where he spent his youthful days, and uh, 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 he uh, was in love with a, with a girlfriend, with his girlfriend, and he spent many happy and sweet hours at that house. And the name of the poem is Mulakat, Mualakat. It's an Arabic poem. This poem has a great influence on this poem. And uh, Alfred Tennyson uh, composed this poem in the form of dramatic monologue. And the whole poem is written in the form of rhymed couple. You see, breast, crest, dove, love, rhyming at the end of the each bar, at the end of each bar, bars. And uh, as I told you that the young man spent his days of youth when he was in love with Amy in Loxley Hall. He describes the time, it's the time of spring. Spring is the season of love. Spring is the season of colors. And there was happiness. Let me read it out. In spring, a fuller crimson comes upon the robin's breast. In the spring, the wanton lapwing 
gets himself another crest. In the spring, a livelier iris changes on the burnished dove. In the spring, a young man's fancy, fancy lightly turns to thoughts of love. A young man's fancy lightly turns to thoughts of love. That means spring is the season of color, as I told you. Uh, robin and lapwing are the names of birds and they get different look in spring. They are very bright and uh, there is color in the breast of the robin. Robin, lapwing and dove are colorful during the spring and he was madly in love with Amy. Amy also loved her but she blatantly says that, say, said that she hid her feeling. Though Amy loved the speaker, she hid her feeling because she, she was afraid of her parents. She knew the proclivity of her parents. She was well aware of the social mindset that the speaker or the person whom she was in love is lower than their uh, social class and uh, the family was class conscious. Anyway, that's why she says, say, says, said that, I have hit my feelings, fearing they should do me wrong. And as a result, Amy was married to another man who was uh, of the same class of the family. And accordingly, the speaker courages the relationship, she also courage, he also courages Amy's parents. Uh, at one stage, the speaker says that, Oh my cousin, shallow hearted, oh my Amy, mine no more. Oh the dreary, dreary moonland, oh the barren, barren shore. You have to be mindful of one thing that mind and nature is uh, the, the, the emotion of mind and the nature is at times shared. It is reciprocated. And that is the theory of correspondence, which, we, uh, uh, which was first introduced by P.B. Shelley, a romantic poet. And here it is visible. Uh, we can uh, study the psychology of the speaker easily. Uh, the speaker is a, a man of highly volatile man, right? highly volatile personality. He shift, he's very shifty, his emotion shifts from one stage to another stage. At first, he was speaking about his personal life, his love, his hope and frustration, uh, and uh, his uh, disillusionment and disappointment over the rejection of, uh, of his love. At the same time, he also speaks about the social condition. Uh, uh, he uh, says that, uh, as the husband is, the wife is, thou art mated with a clown, and the grossness of his nature will have weight to drag thee down. The speaker again, at, in another occasion, says, Cursed be the social ones that sin against the strength of youth. The love of youth has no value to gold, to money. Uh, and uh, love has no meaning. We have built up such a society and such a civilization where love is of little value. And, and, and uh, that's why he says that though the world is going ahead day by day, there is a uh, huge development in every sphere of life. But the condition of the individual is very deplorable. Uh, and, and accordingly, the speaker, in course of the poem, says that uh, knowledge comes but wisdom lingers and I linger on the show and the individual withers and the world is more and more. Knowledge comes but wisdom lingers and he bears a laden breast full of sad experience moving toward the stillness of his rest. These are very important line. If you have the text you can see it. Knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is developing. What is knowledge? Knowledge is based on information. And uh, wisdom is deeper than knowledge. Wisdom does not go 
in pace with the knowledge. Knowledge is based on information. And there is the development, apparent development. But in the truest sense, uh, the development does, uh, did not touch at all level. The individual level, at the individual level, uh, it is uh, not uh, happy. And uh, we don't see the happy picture at the individual level. That's why he says that knowledge grows, but wisdom lingers. And uh, in, this, in this way, we can see that he sees the vision of the world. And uh, he uh, prophesizes, he predicts about the future of human civilization. He speaks about parliament, federation of the world. In, in later ages, you can see that League of Nations was formed and it was uh, prophesized in this poem by Tennyson in, in the version of the speaker of this uh, poem. And uh, we can also uh, see uh, that the invention of aeroplane or aircraft is also predicted in this poem. And throughout the poem, the speaker speaks out his mind and he expresses his frustrations and hope in course of the, in course of the poem. And uh, uh, we can see two voices. In one voice, he expresses his personal pain when he was in love with Amy and how his love was unreciprocated. He had, a, he had an unrecreated love. And in the second voice, he uh, struggles to get rid of the frustrations uh, over the rejection of love. Accordingly, we can see that at the very beginning, he requested, he requests his comrades to blow the bugle horn so that uh, he can uh, join them in time of their need. And now we can hear the sound of the bugle horn. That means his comrades are calling him. And towards the end, to the big, uh, towards the ending of the poem, we can see that the poet struggles to brush away the frustration. He wants to leave the European civilization of the Victorian period. He uh, uh, is not liking the development, apparent development, the development of railway and stream engine and other uh, scientific discovery that took place during the Victorian period. He was not quite satisfied with all of them. So he wants to shift to a tropical area where he can lead a national life uh, beyond the life of the European snowberry. This is how he wants to overcome his frustration and personal pain. Dear students, now I will ask you to read the poem again and again, critically and analytically. I have uh, written a few short questions for you. Please get the camera closer to it, focus on it. Uh, some short questions. You can practice at home. How does Tennyson denounce the materialism of his age in Locksley Hall? You know the meaning of materialism. That is worldliness of the Victorian period. How does Tennyson denounce the materialism of his age in Locksley Hall? To number question, how does Tennyson satirize the Victorian age in Locksley Hall? Question number three, what is Tennyson's opinion about knowledge and wisdom? Question four, what optimistic belief of Tennyson do you find in the poem Locksley Hall? So, these are the short questions. As I told you, and I could not read the poem to the letter, but it's important to add here that it is not a poem of frustration only. There is also hope. Uh, the speaker, when he was uh, in a uh, deep frustration, says that he will uh, mix with the action. He will uh, uh, 
mixed with the action of the world. And he will uh, leave Europe and settle in some other parts of the world. And you will read the poem, then you will be able to answer these questions. I will ask you to write a broad question, which are common in the university question. Critically analyze the Victorian elements which are available in Locksley Hall. This is a broad question. Critically analyze the Victorian elements that you find in Locksley Hall. Sorry. You can take preparation on this question. Critically analyze the Victorian elements that you find in Locksley Hall. Uh, there are a lot of Victorian elements in course of the poem and you can find it in the version of the speaker and I hope you will uh, try to develop this question in your own critically and an analytically anyway dear students the lesson is almost terminated and you know we are under the cruel classes of corona virus COVID-19 and we'll have to uh, stay safe We'll have to stay at home and you will maintain every precaution. You will be super conscious and make the people super conscious. Uh, for now, that's all. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.